And we now have Geraldine Rowley, who is Communications and Policy Manager with Rahama, uh, and will outline some of the experiences of the organisation. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Do you need any PowerPoint? Or so good afternoon, everyone. I don't know if I'm going to talk for 10 minutes, so you mightn't have to ring the bell too much for me, but uh, just want to outline, um, I suppose basically introduce Ruhama, but also uh, how we have been involved in, in media work. And I know that the brief that I got uh, as well was also maybe to talk a little bit about um, maybe some of the, the difficulties we would experience in doing media work or maybe how media could cooperate more uh, as well. Um, just to say, for those of you who don't know, Ruhama was set up uh, in 1989 uh, in Dublin, Dublin based, to work specifically with women in prostitution. But um, over two decades the work has developed. Uh, we were working mostly at the beginning with street based prostitution, but unfortunately the nature of prostitution has expanded and throughout the country and we now work on a nationwide basis. And uh, I suppose due to some of the success of our work that uh, lots of women have left prostitution. Uh, so we work with women now, not alone who are active in prostitution, but also women who have a history of prostitution, but the issues are still there for them. And um, also we would work with women who uh, are victims of the crime of sex trafficking. And unfortunately, it also has been uh, a growing crime in our society. And. Uh, I suppose Ruhama's philosophy and strategic plan is what guides all our media work. We are a frontline service first and foremost uh, and I suppose we got uh, drawn into media work because we realised, like I think a lot of other people, that if you are working with people on the margins, you have to be involved in acti activism because you realise the structures that are there in society that are holding people in situations of poverty or injustice or inequality. So you, you can't help but be forced to, to speak out. But uh, Ruhama, uh, I suppose, our, our philosophy is very much the dignity and the respect of the person. And uh, we also have a position on prostitution where we see it as harmful. And we also view it uh, through the prism of, of violence against women. Now, we work with women in prostitution, but we do have sympathy uh, and, and concern for men who find themselves prostituted or children or transgender people. But it's just as a project and resource wise, um, we are limited to working with women and women are predominantly the majority in prostitution. So strategically, I suppose, when we work with the, the media, our plan is to increase women's access to services like ourselves. We're, we're the only organisation on the island of Ireland that works solely on the issue of prostitution. And we also have a strand within our project that if women want to leave prostitution, we have programmes to empower and support women and to open up options to find alternatives in their lives. But the nature of prostitution, it's very isolating. For instance, women in street-based prostitution may be sleeping all day, may um, find themselves uh, on the street in prostitution at night time. They often find themselves out of the system, every kind of a system. They're only dealing with the people who are uh, using them at night time or perhaps pimps or drug users or wh whatever. So they're, they're out of the system and, and usually those in street prostitution today are Irish but they're still not engaging with a lot of systems. Uh, and also uh, with an increasing number of women who uh, are not Irish, who are in the, the sex trade here, it also means that they don't know about what services are available. And what we find is often women stay with the traffickers or the pimps because they don't know there's any help out there. So we hope by engaging in media, and I would have to really say thank you, a big thank you to Near FM because they have been hugely supportive to Rahama and uh, I've spoken to Noel McGuinness many a time but today was my first day of meeting him face to face so a very, and I did an interview with him today as well but we really appreciate getting our message out there uh, letting people know what services are available we also are involved in campaigning and uh, we would realise we're very much up against um, uh, I suppose the pro-sex worker lobby, which uh, often is fueled and run by those who are financially profiting from prostitution. For instance, there is a, a group who run uh, an escort advertising uh, 
service and profit hugely on the island of this Ireland that run quite a, a sophisticated PR and marketing campaign for prostitution. And we're constantly aware that we're up against the sex trade, the sexualization of people, the marketing of the sex trade. So we have to be out there as much. And we have over the years challenged the sex trade entering mainstream media. For instance, we would run cam campaigns against the growth in the lap dancing clubs in Ireland. And we are very happy to say that uh, Stringfellas, who came to Ireland and crowned himself king of the clubs, didn't last six months. And actually, that was due to local activism. The people in Parnell Street said, sorry, you're not coming here, and they picketed it. Now, we would have supported that uh, um, picket, but um, it was local groups who felt this is our community and we don't want you. Now I'd have to say the same guy didn't do a lot about local community because when he walked in he actually would have said he was coming to basically make the, the area more sophisticated but the, the local groups didn't uh, feel that's what was sophistication. We would also be very much involved in dispelling the myths and stereotypes that sent out there about women who find themselves in prostitution. And there's just so much myth, again, so much marketing of a glamorous lifestyle, of a career. And, you know, every day in our centre and our workers in outreach, and we have a van on the streets at night time, we see a very different um, reality. Um, we also would be involved in, I suppose, influencing our policy makers, uh, influencing um, legislation we use the, the media for that uh, and currently there is a consultation process happening on the law on prostitution and we're part of a, a broad alliance of groups who are campaigning currently for the criminalization of the purchase of sexual services and again it's to try and look at putting deterrence in place and looking at the demand in the sex trade because if there weren't consumers then our pimps and traffickers wouldn't find a market and the campaign is called turn off the red light and we're part of that and there's lots of media work in, involved with that and with the other alliances and last year we ran a campaign called women sell sex because they have to not because they want to and again it was really trying to highlight the impact that the sex trade has on women so we are actually as a project quite active in briefing journalists uh, in um, carrying out press conferences uh, press releases and try to respond to as much requests and I'd have to say we have very positive experiences. Certainly, Ruhama's profile has increased. Women's access has increased to Ruhama. We also find that due to the public awareness of prostitution and sex trafficking, that the general public sometimes ring us, that they're able to identify the harm now of prostitution and the indicators that there's a house next door, there's foreign women in it. I don't see them ever going out, but I see men coming constantly. I see men dropping them off in cars that look like pimps. And they sometimes might ring us and say, should we do something about this? Uh, should we contact the Gardaí? We would say yes. But sometimes they say, will we contact the Gardaí for them? And also men who buy sex have also, uh, from time to time, contacted Ruhama because they are aware now of, of the harm of prostitution and reported what they have seen within the sex trade. So it's certainly the public awareness is really important. Uh, I suppose there have been a number of um, articles or, or programmes, for instance, Primetime have done uh, investigative journalism in this area and they have exposed, I suppose, the underbelly, the real criminality that is behind the sex trade. Um, and also, I suppose it has been wonderful to see in more recent years that survivors of prostitution have also found uh, the media and, and a place to to uh, tell their stories and get their voice heard. I suppose if we had issues with the media, and it's something that I suppose every day we could nearly be writing to some journalist or some editor or someone and saying, oh, you know, did you have to present prostitution that way or whatever. But, um, you know, we just don't do it unless there's something that's major, uh, because sometimes the language that's used when it discusses women, um, you might notice that I haven't used the language sex worker and I haven't used the language prostitute, because again, it's getting back to our belief and our philosophy, which is very much the person. It's person centered. And the one thing prostitution does is it dehumanizes the woman. And often when the media speak about prostitution, they dehumanise the woman. She's a hooker. 
There'll be language like this. Um, you know, it, it's not a real woman we're hearing. Uh, we don't use the word sex worker because we believe it frames prostitution as work and that's our particular view. Oh gosh, I am time up already. So I suppose challenging the language uh, is, is really important because sometimes women who were victims of trafficking and all they felt was they were abused, they were raped and suddenly they're called a sex worker and they're thinking like, I was never a sex worker. Um, we would have issues in the media sometimes when they expose women's identity, sometimes out of court, outside courts women's pictures have been taken and again they have been victims of trafficking and victims of pimping but again the media thought well she's a prostitute so I'll just take her picture. Uh, I suppose salacious reporting of a serious issue that's a big challenge in this area because it, it's a bit like what some of the input earlier this morning talked about what do people want? People want salacious stories sometimes so the, I suppose the area we work in is, is just wide open to being salacious um, just as a service provider, a frontline service pro provider whose primary work is the care of the people we work with, we want to work with media. We know the importance of getting the first hand experience out there that would be our, our women in our service. But we sometimes feel a pressure on, from media. They just ring up and say, Is there a woman in your service who talked to us? And, like, it's not our job, number one, to keep going to women. It's not our role. Women come to us for care, not for us to be all the time looking for them to speak to the media. But also, for the media to be sensitive around, it's very difficult to talk about this issue. People may still be in a recovery mode. Um, uh, it's something it's not easy to talk about. Uh, again, identification is a huge stigma attached to it. But... Um, I suppose the lack of understanding sometimes by media and the lack of awareness of how vulnerable, just because someone might present themselves, I mean for all of us it's a challenge to be out there in the public, it's, it's, you know, it's a challenge for me to stand here today, any of us, but can't you imagine what it must be like for some of these women? So I mean some people are great and I appreciate that those in the media world, I hear the pressure they are often under and it's a bit tying into what we talked about this morning, uh, it's immediate news and media and people are looking for the voice but I would have to say it has been great that maybe documentaries or slower paced media uh, there were and are women in our service who have given interviews it has been great we would always support them in that and, and try and empower them uh, and their voice is so important uh, in I suppose speaking about this issue I would also warn um, perhaps media if you are out there and you are taking information you may need to check out your sources because again there are people currently in Ireland who have serious financial vested interests in keeping the sex trade where it is and exploiting women and they are putting out brilliant stuff on blogs and that and, and you know journalists have come to us and, and we said and where did you get that quote from and when they tell us you know, they need to check out exactly who's behind blogs. It's, it's that anonymity. So, you know, do check out sources. So thank you for listening. Yeah.